Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ray. I am a detransition male. And today I want to do something a little special. I want to react to some of my old trans activist TikToks. Because <laughs> uh, back in the day when I was trans identified, I was a trans activist. So, um, and I was a published, a published author who wrote in the field of trans philosophy, trans feminism, so, and I used to write a bunch of essays on trans activism and trans philosophy. And I, so I was always sort of engaged in the discourse, trying to defend gender identity ideology. And so I want to react to this clip because it like, it illustrates like um, how I approached um, these issues a lot back then philosophically. And then I want to critique that and, and show like how my mind has changed since I have detransitioned and you know grown more gr grown more gender critical in um, my thought process. So okay, I'm gonna play the clip now. Gender is a social thing. It only I don't makes sense. What is a woman? Word woman, define in the dictionary. The 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein argued that our understanding of words cannot be fully exhausted in such things as dictionary definitions. We have a unconscious, pragmatic, tacit, implicit, subtle, nuanced understanding of words and concepts and things in the world that cannot always be fully articulated into the precise propositional language of a dictionary um, and even dictionaries themselves are usually circular because the definitions um, assume certain facts about the world or about other concepts or assume certain values or normative ideas. So it's just amateur philosophy right here. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, it's just, it's just kind of funny looking at my past self as, as Rachel, just sort of like, you know, uh, just first off, just like, uh, you know, how I talked, I, I, I talked a little differently. I'm not sure if it's noticeable or if you can tell, but I was doing a little bit of vocal training such I was lifting the pitch up and trying to lift up the resonance. And I would have more, I would try to imitate more female speaking patterns in terms of intonation. So I kind of ended up sounding like kind of like a uh, like a valley girl sort of in terms of that like stoner california accent in terms of how i talked whereas like now like now that i've de now that i've detransitioned and i'm not trying to artificially pitch up my voice or shift my resonance around or you can sort of tell now that i have more of a deeper resonance that's more my, my more natural resonance um, so it's like much more comfortable to speak because I'm not, it, it, it doesn't sound quite as constrained or artificial or sort of soft and quiet. I feel like I can now project more power in my voice and I have more of a full range of expression that dips into every aspect of my full um, range and like my resonance and like my pitch. So I can kind of take advantage of the full spectrum of my voice and use the, that full spectrum of my voice to communicate different um, things and how I speak. Whereas like before and how I spoke, it was like, I don't think my range of expression was quite as um, communicative because I could only tap into certain frequencies and patterns within my natural range. So that was just like the first thing that like, that jumps out to me when I watched my past self was like how artificial my speaking was it was not natural <laughs> it sort of became natural over time because that sort of art artificiality became habituated such that it just became um you know uh common for me to do that but it would i would consciously uh engage in that to sort of shift it even more extreme into this like soft this soft way of speaking when i was on like the phone and i was like trying to pass as female because you know if i'm calling some institution and like legally my name in the system is like rachel so like they're going to expect like a female 
a voice or, or a female sounding voice on the phone. So I would sort of like sort of pitch it up e even more and sort of like really sort of strain myself to sound more feminine. But it was ultimately just very artificial. And like that, that is one of my big criticisms of, vo of vocal training is that it takes the full range of your natural voice and then it like restricts it to a smaller space, a smaller subset of, of that range. And, and you sort of lose a lot of the expressiveness in your voice. And I think that is so sad <laughs> because like our voices are unique signatures. And when I hear these trans women talking, um, it's just, they sound like restricted, a restricted version of themselves that's been artificially constrained to imitate a feminine pattern of speaking. And it's very rare, I think, for the trans women who do do vocal training to make it sound like fully natural, I, I guess. Um, so anyway, that's sort of just like <laughs> a sort of sur sur surface level commentary on, on that video in terms of like what it makes me think of when I see it. Um, also, I, sometimes I kind of miss having that long hair. I've, I've kind of debated like growing it back out, but um, it, it's a lot easier to maintain short um, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot less work. Um, so that, that is nice. But sometimes I do, I do miss that long hair and I've, and, and I've contemplated growing it back out again, but I'm like reluctant to do so just because of like the, the awkward stages of growing out are really annoying. <laughs> so it, anyway, getting to the more philosophical meat of the argument, this was very prototypical for the way that I thought about things like gender identity and transgender ideology was in this concept of what would be called late Wittgensteinian pragmatism, which is this approach to conceptual analysis. Because Historically, in philosophy, conceptual analysis has been in terms of analytically deconstructing concepts and words that we find in ordinary language and sort of like reducing them down to necessary and sufficient conditions such that you are precisely and logically defining the criteria and the boundaries of that concept. Well, Ludwig Wittgenstein was this genius philosopher in the 20th century who sort of took a um, contrarian approach to classical conceptual analysis within analytical philosophy. And he took what would be considered a more pragmatic approach such that he thought that language itself is really revolves around what he called language games. And there's these pragmatic things where fundamentally the meaning of a concept, the meaning of a word is what you do with it essentially it's it's sort of it's it's rooted in doing in action and the pragmatics associated with that specific pragmatic context um, or or situatedness so he really thought that the meaning of a word is um not like most words could not be defined in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions but in order to understand the meaning of a word you have to understand how the word is being used in um, pragmatic context. And typically in these pragmatic contexts, there's a sort of fuzziness or a looseness to this such that it is really like a tacit un un understanding. The classic example is the concept of chair. Philosophically speaking, it has been incredibly difficult to precisely define the boundary conditions of a chair that satisfies all um, that that includes all chairs that we commonly recognize intu intuitively as chairs, and exclude everything on that definition that is that that we intuitively think of as like not a chair. Um, but nevertheless, the idea is that we sort of know a chair when we see it, even if we can't give precise and necessary um, conditions for defining the nature of a chair, and. The trans activists love this Wittgensteinian approach, and 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 th th this was like my bread and butter as like a trans activist <laughs> because when we're thinking about this debate about what is a woman, you know, thinking about like Matt Walsh and like all these you know conservatives and the sort of 
the like gender critical pers perspective that like a woman is an adult hu 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 human female. The Wittgensteinian pragmatic transactivist wants to say that, well, I can't define precisely what is a woman, but I know what a woman is um, regardless because, you know, we have this sort of like pragmatic, unconscious, tacit understanding of a woman such that, you know, it's like this socially constructed thing and we have like these language games and we sort of like, you know, we all kind of know what, what, what a woman is, but we can't precisely define it because it's sort of like the, the the pragmatics of that concept are too loosely defined to be precisely nailed down. Um, however, I have since changed my mind about that Wittgensteinian approach because first of all, I think prior to the introduction and the widespread popularity of gender identi gender identity ideology i do think that the actual pragmatics of the term woman and man did refer to the biologically reductionistic account of the definition of woman as adult human female and man as adult human male so i do think pragmatically and sort of the, the language game of that concept was referring to the biological categories of male and female, which is defined by our reproductive capabilities, just in the same way that the language game and the pragmatics of, you know, different um, vocabulary for, you know, animals, you know, bulls and cows refers to, you know, the males and the females of that species. Well, man and woman is kind of like the same thing. And so even if, um, you know, we couldn't like precisely define it, um, you know, that roughly matches the pragmatics of how it was used in those contexts. And it was only with the introduction uh, of transgender people into mainstream consciousness that it sort of threw a wrinkle into that established pragmatic understanding of what a woman is. Um, but now if you look in the dictionary you'll see these secondary and tertiary definitions of a woman beyond the original you know definition as an adult hu human female that includes you know, like well a woman is anyone who has the gender identity that's like opposite of like a male or or something like this you'll see this in in the miriam webster um definition and so the transactors like to say well look like you know, the, the language games and, and the pragmatics of the term woman are evolving over time. There's like a new language game now that is inclusive of, you know, transgender people and this new concept of, of like gender identities. So, so this pragmatic language game is like evolving to include a more nuanced analysis like gender and all this stuff. But I actually don't think this works because even if the concept of woman is evolving in these linguistic subcultures like the trans subculture because the trans subculture there is a unique language in the trans subculture that is you know specific to that subculture and they do define the term and and and, and they they do define the term woman differently in that subculture but <laughs> um just because a subculture has a new definition of a term that does not provide sufficient justification for abandoning the primary definition um, and the pragmatics surrounding that primary def definition of woman as adult hu human female precisely because the phenomenon of transgenderism in our society has necessitated a new pragmatic reality that makes it necessary to uh, zoom in and narrow in on that definition of woman as adult human female precisely because the transgender people are challenging established social categories that were previously just taken for granted so for example in the sports issue you had men's sports and women's sports, and we just had like a pragmatic, tacit understanding of what that means as referring to, you know, a biological um, categorization in terms of, you know, it's really like men's sports is male sports and um, women's sports is female sports, 
with that basic understanding defined relative to our reproductive capabilities in terms of like biological sex and on like the gamete account that was all sort of like taken for granted but that was like the implicit reference of those um, concepts was referring to those underlying sexual dimorphic biological realities of male and female but now with the transgender women entering into the sports world you know it's requiring that we sort of take what was previously assumed to be like an unconscious pragmatic thing and we have to precisify that and narrow in on this definition that woman is adult hu human female and we have to give those necessary and sufficient conditions to to define woman and and and, and make it precisified in order to um protect these sociological categories that were previously just taken for granted um, because the trans activists and the gender ideological movement is trying to undermine those traditional historical pragmatic language games and introducing new language games that are driven from you know this academic gender theory that are driven from trans activism that are driven from you know the postmodern phenomenological tradition that comes out of like um you know, the, uh, the like continental philosophy and post-structuralism and the sort of like academic world of like gender theory and all this stuff. So, so that, that sort of my critique of like the Wittgensteinian approach, which sort of says like, well, this whole attempt to appeal to dictionary definitions and necessary and sufficient conditions and these precise ways of dealing with things, you know, I do think it is necessary to define a new pragmatics a new language game <laughs> that uh, does precisify things um, because the pragmatics of transgenderism, like trying to undermine these, tra these tr traditional sociological categories, that has necessitated a new need to focus and to define things in a way that were taken for granted previously. Um, and so that is sort of my response to my old way of thinking is that it's not that I think that Wittgenstein is wrong. I do think language is defined by the pragmatics of usage. I still think that's true. And I do think a lot of our conceptual schemas are these sorts of like webs of belief that have these sort of like circular um, you know, patterns of conceptual linkages in terms of how we think in terms of this web of belief, but nevertheless, the new pragmatics of social reality necessitate um, the, the, the need to define a new language game in regards to woman and man in order to shore up these sociological practices. Um, so that's sort of my thought on that. And this attempt to, um, use Wittgensteinian pragmatics to sort of like avoid the issue of trying to say like, what is a woman? What is a man? It is often used to obfuscate and to sort of defend, you know, the denial of biological reality to sort of deny the sexual dimorphism of the human species to deny that trans women are male and to deny the innate sex differences that accompany being male. And so I think a lot of this Wittgensteinian pragmatics of wanting to, you know, avoid defining concepts and saying it's all circular and blah, blah, blah. It is a way to avoid the recognition of the reality of innate sex differences that define males and females and sort of prevent, you know, trans people from coming to terms with the own, with, with the reality of their bodies and like the, the reality of like um, their their maleness or their femaleness, and I think that from a therapeutic perspective can can be problematic because I think it causes people to run away from reality. Not not in all cases. There are some trans people who you know are you know fully cognizant of the reality of their biological sex, but so often I think these sorts of philosophical mental gymnastics provide a uh, pathway for trans people to use these intellectual academic philosophical theories to run away from reality and then to sort of gaslight everyone else into thinking that you know our species is not sexually dimorphic 
that males are different than females, that you know, the sex binary is socially constructed and all these sort of things that we now sort of associate with gender theory. So that is sort of my other problem with this Wittgensteinian approach, which is that, you know, it is just running away from the problem. And I think it just causes more problems therapeutically rather than um, accepting these biologically reductionistic theories and just acknowledging that like these concepts are important for maintaining uh, recognition of the fact that we are a sexually dimorphic species and that that actually does have ramifications for understanding human nature and for under understanding ourselves and, and for coming to terms with the reality of these innate sex differences that are like well-established in the biological sciences. Uh, and that's important for recognizing the distinct needs of, you know, females and males and, you know, the, the importance of, you know, female only spaces and stuff like this. So, okay, that's it for this video. Um, hopefully this was interesting. <laughs> I know it's certainly fun for me to look back at these old videos. Um, so, Okay, thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.